You want me to put this on? Sure. All right. Are we ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Are we ready? This is Governor Mike Beebe. What am I? I'm a product of Arkansas. My mantra politically for myself is under promise and over deliver. What he said, what you saw, is what you got. The atmosphere when he was governor. If you just tell people the truth, not what they want to hear, or not what you think they want to hear. Behind every successful individual is a great story. One of the best there. governors we've ever known in this state. I don't think anybody could beat him. We had a great collection of gray hairs and youthful exudes. He's calculating and he's very safe. The willingness to do what it took and to get a job he done. Wants to win. For education. He kept us in it kind of together. It was calm, cool, collected. He often said he didn't micromanage state government, Once which you get he that didn't, done. except for the budget. Mike BB from Sirs up, and he's the next Clinton. That's what everybody Those was saying. knew me or felt like they knew me well Mike enough. Mike BB had a huge and network. Raised the standard of living for people. Changed a corrupt system. There are so many things, though, that happened with the hardest truth that he had to tell. Out a lot of fool, but thought. they fell in place because he tactically waited for them to fall in place. JFK. John F. Kennedy. His role model in politics was always JFK. I never had stockings as a kid at Christmas. I never had a East Capacity. I remember the fifth grade in Newport. I knew it was my Hanging baby. out a lot at the train station. Had to adapt to so many situations. I was to the so many And I pause. And I say in the next eighth of a second, 28 babies are going to be born in the world. Another 28. The next 28 babies that are going to be born in the world, one of them gets to be an American. And all of a sudden, it gets real quiet. And in many of those other 27 babies, they don't have a school to go to or a dirt road to walk, uh, a paved road to walk down, or an indoor toilet to flush, much less a McDonald's or a drive in movie or a theater or a car or a house. That's what it means. So, I'm lucky because I was one of those that were born in America. I got to take advantage of the opportunity to get a quality education, the opportunity to pursue a course and profession in life that uh, uh, most folks wouldn't even get a chance to pursue. The opportunity to hold the highest office our state has to offer from a background that we all know I came from. Uh, what other country in the world would a baby born be able to do that? Now that is allegedly the house I was born in. And I think, I'm pretty sure that's my great aunt who delivered me. So that's, that's, they told me that that's the house. You see those uh, tar paper uh, shingles? Old, old tar paper shingles. <laughs> where Mike was born some 18 months earlier. All right, this, this is four generations. So that's Grandma Junior and my grandmother and my mother and me. There's four generations. Mike's upbringing had a lot to do with the person he is today. Uh, he was raised by a, a single parent, his mom, who was married several times as he was growing up. And so he lived in a, a lot of different states as a young child. Voila, this is Detroit. This is the back or side of uh, the house my grandmother lived in in Detroit, I recognize it. 2744 Military Avenue. Telephone number Tashmo 63615. And that is near that, my grandmother's house in Detroit. That, and, and what, I gotta be like three years old, looks like. That's me in a bathing suit. Uh, this is seventh grade picture in Alamogordo, New Mexico. A little kid at Christmas time, probably in Tuckerman at my aunt's house, but I can't be sure. Every time there was a, a change in his location, uh, he came back home to his aunt, which was his mother's sister, that had a farm in Tuckerman. And uh, when he was in junior high and high school, she moved to Newport and worked. She was always a waitress, and he'll tell you she never finished um, high school. She never had a car. 
course, times were different then. That's my mother and my grandmother. This is uh, at the city drugstore in Tuckerman, Tuckerman, Arkansas. I mean, I see the sign in the city drugstore, and that's the only city drugstore. That's me and my mother, uh, my oldest cousin, and I think that man is one of my stepdads. We were with him in Florida and Houston for not very long. I don't know who this is. Uh, it looks like James Cagney. <laughs> it looks like a gangster. <laughs> And somebody's written on the back, I think this is Ken Beebe, who's my father on the birth certificate. But if it's him, I don't know, because I never saw him. When you're always moving around, when your mother's name changes, last name changes, uh, and it's always different than yours, uh, when you don't have a car, when you don't have a telephone in your house, uh, when you don't have any of those things that everybody else has, uh, and you're a kid, sure, it's embarrassing. I'd never want my mother to know that. The families that took me in, my recollections of all that occurred from the ninth grade on. They all knew my mother, where she worked, what she was doing, and the fact that she, uh, that there was nobody home to cook me a, a meal, and if I was gonna eat, I was either gonna go to the restaurant, which she always wanted me to do, incidentally, uh, or be at their house. And there were several houses that took everyone in the community together, saying, you know, come over to our house if your mom's working late, uh, come eat. Um, they helped. And I think he saw that people were so giving to help him. As a result of that, I mean, if you're worth your salt, uh, you, you need to pay it forward. Sometimes it's just what's within a person, you know, that um, they, want to change things. They want to have a better life than what maybe their family had. I know I had help. Uh, I had a hardworking mother uh, who made sure I understood the, the need for education. Uh, I developed an ability to talk. Maybe it was because I was always a new kid and I had to learn something, and so uh, I learned how to communicate. All of those things certainly aided or assisted. But deep down inside, there's probably an ambition. Uh, and, and who knows what sparks ambition in one child and not in another. Where he may have been embarrassed about his mom, that's part of the great story today. He may have been embarrassed about them having to move around and not having the things that he had. But that was, that was all in a melting pot that was building the man because that something was developing this, this amazing talent. Education was something that his mother um, really harped on. But I heard him talk about how she did not get that education and she wanted to make sure her son got an education. That's me in uh, probably college, could be high school. Look at the knot on that tie, how thick it was. I joined a fraternity, and they were pretty cheap back then. I mean, I don't know how we afforded the dues, really, looking back on it. But it's one of the best things that ever happened to me because you had to have the grades, uh, a grade point to be able, and, and that was the impetus necessary for me to do okay. Oh, I, I mean, I was an okay student, and then the sophomore-itis hit, and uh, that was my worst year. I had a 2.03 one semester uh, of my sophomore year. Uh, I was really, really uh, doing a lot of things besides studying. Mike was ahead of me, and he'd already joined the fraternity, and I joined later, and he was my big brother. So he was the guy that was responsible for keeping me in line, if you can imagine that. He was a leader, he was a born leader, had a charisma about him in college. He just had an air about himself. We were studying one night, and uh, I had a mobile home right on campus. It's a front dining room mobile home, and we'd cram before a test. It must have been 2 a.m. in the morning, and uh, Mike looked at me one night, and he said, uh, what do you want to do in life? And I, it kind of stunned me, and I looked at him, and I said, well, I've never had anything. I'd, I'd like to get wealthy. I'd like to get rich. I want to get rich. I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to be governor of the state of Arkansas. And I kind of chuckled. Well, I mean, that was really pretty far-fetched. I mean, I could see the role of working your tail off and saving your money and 
finding the right deal and getting wealthy, but to be governor of the state of Arkansas, it was so far out there that even as talented as he was, I, I couldn't believe it. I went to law school specifically to be in the FBI, and I was editor of the Law Review, which is the top position, I think, in, in law school. The summer between my first and second year in law school, I worked in Searcy uh, for the law firm that I ultimately joined. And uh, it was a summer job and I really liked it. It made me decide that practicing law, particularly in a smaller town like Searcy, was something I'd rather do than uh, go in the FBI. So uh, that time frame uh, while I was in law school changed the whole purpose for me going to law school. And, there weren't a lot of job offers at the time, but I had three. One in a firm in Prescott, one in a firm in Jonesboro, and then the firm here in Searcy that I had clerked for. And the cheapest one was the one here in Searcy. And uh, I almost didn't come. Uh, and one of the partners said, if you're as good as you think you are, uh, that within a short time you'll be a partner here and making a lot more money than you would in either one of those places where it probably wouldn't be a partner for some length of time. Uh, yeah, I made partner in two years. This was at uh, Magic Springs. And you see the white bell bottom pants? Uh, you had to be skinny to wear them, and I was pretty skinny. Looked like Saturday Night Fever. I met the governor uh, in Cersei. He was practicing law. I'm um, probably 75. She's born in Cersei. She uh, grew up in Cersei. She's a Cersei girl. We met while we were working on some service projects in the community. She looks great, and uh, she's bubbly, uh, effervescent. Uh, she's dynamo, a little bitty dynamo. Uh, this is before Ginger and I were married. This is David and Tammy, her two children from a previous marriage, and me with an Easter basket, because I never had an Easter basket until Ginger made me one. So this was 1978, a year before we got married. Yeah, that was our house uh, before we built this house. On our first date, we went to a movie. I think we went to see Jaws. He maybe thought it was Jaws. No, I don't think so. I don't remember. But it wasn't important, probably, the movie. It was that we were together. I tell you, though, when I really impressed her, I took her out to dinner to Jacques and Suzanne's and ordered in French. Now, she didn't know what I was saying, and I'm not sure the waiter did. <laughs> Look at this guy here, huh? Skinny, huh? Uh, we got married in uh, March. Uh, we didn't go on honeymoon until that summer, June, I think, June or July. And we went to the Bahamas. I think I was in my 20, maybe 29 or 30. She was 26, something like that. I allotted ourselves a hundred dollars a day for eating and, and uh, entertainment. <laughs> That's all we had. I think one of the things that probably did attract me was his honesty. Um, and I knew he was a person who was loyal. Um, he could be your best friend and he was always going to be your friend, regardless of the good or bad. He was going to be there for you. And I, I think I, I sensed that in him. Even though he was a little cocky, he knew it. He is persuasive. He has vital confidence. But sometimes he can just take your breath away with his self-adoration. The common phrase about him was he was the only man people knew who could strut sitting down. I could hear this man walk down the hall. If my door was closed in my office, you knew by his strut that Mike Beebe was walking down the hall. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you, <laughs> I was, I thought I was hot stuff, you know? I always kind of had that problem. The first case that really put Mike and our firm on the map is the chicken house case. But it was tried in Cleveland County in Heber Springs, and uh, the jury came back and awarded the estate $4.1 million, which at the time was the largest verdict ever returned by a jury in the state of Arkansas, by far. It was a hard case to lose. That's really... That, that really tells you a lot about him and about how he made his choices in his political career. He's, he's not a chance taker. 
He doesn't look for a chance. He looks for a certainty. And we built it because I just won that first huge case. And I always wanted a house with columns because uh, I'd seen people's houses that had columns and liked it. My first recollection of having any political interest uh, surrounded John F. Kennedy. And it naturally grew from there. Uh, it wasn't real prevalent uh, throughout my high school years and, and uh, early college years. I mean, I was a typical kid, you know? I was worried about girls or, or friends or doing something besides thinking too much about politics. He studied from an early age John F. Kennedy and he fancied himself as having skills akin to JFK's. He did. He probably saw President Kennedy's compassion and his removal of self, that he was willing to rise above what he wanted or needed or thought was right, to focus on the greater good and a cause greater than himself. I remember when Mike and I dated, he, he talked about politics. And then when the redistricting, which is done every 10 years, uh, was completed in 1980, it opened up an opportunity for him to run to the Senate. And so in the 1981 redistricting, uh, Bill Wamsley got rid of us. <laughs> and, uh, but threw us in with Stuttgart that had an incumbent senator named Mr. Bill Hargrove, an elderly gentleman at the time. And so I decided to run. And when this young, cocky, smart young man made himself known to that community in Prairie and Arkansas counties, um, they all kind of sided with him. Uh, campaigned against Mr. Bill for several months, and uh, before the filing period, uh, he decided to drop out of the race. I think when he first started, as far as his Senate campaign in 83, probably he ended up running unopposed because of luck. But I think he certainly within the Senate and within his Senate district itself, he you know, very quickly became extremely popular. They knew they had an individual that was going to represent their interests. He listened to people within his districts. He was surrounded all the time. He would outwork you. He was up before most, and by 9 o'clock, he'd done more than most people would do all day. If you were going to take on Mike Beebe, you not only had to be smart as a whip, but you'd have to work harder than you've ever worked in your life. And that's the way he worked every day. I went way out of my way uh, to make sure I was uh, in that area, physically in that area, at least once a week, uh, even when I was practicing law and making a living. Now, I grew up here in Northeast Arkansas just like most y'all did. I went to Newport High School. I was born in Jackson. He burned the road up. He was everywhere. Uh, beat bushes up and down that district. He went down to meetings, just dinners, breakfast, lunch. Fish fries and college graduations and town meetings and to, to visit people after a tragedy. I guess that naturally evolved into just a routine and a continuation of being out and about and seeing people and talking to them, listening to them. He believed that was what was required to do the job well and I believe he felt a tremendous sense of duty to serve, to be accountable to people, to be up close with people, and for them to be able to reach out and touch him. Potential opponents would just look and say, why would I run against Mike Beebe for state senate? He's going to win. So Mike didn't have an opponent. He never had an opponent. His 20 years as senator, he never had an opponent. Well, the card would have been in 81 or 82. It would have been made in 81, 1981, when I first ran for the Senate. And uh, then the other shops are me. One's me in the Senate. Looks like I'm at the President Pro Tem's desk. The other one is me making a speech. It looks like to a Rotary Club. I don't remember the first time I met him. I remember the first time I heard about him. And everybody was saying there's this new state senator, uh, Mike B.B. from Searcy, and he's the next Clinton. That's what everybody was saying. I didn't get the idea that he, like Bill Clinton, he was dedicated to a, a political career. 
from childhood. So I don't know that he chose it until he got into it. I just know from what I observed. And when he entered the state senate and looked around, he loved this place. I like the stakes, the fact that we're making a budget for the all of state government and making government work. He took to it instantly. He understood early because he wanted to be the boss. The real uh, government is money. Government is the budget. And I have to have complete and utter command of it because not many people do. And he did. The money is one of the main things that uh, the legislature has to deal with. And Knox Nelson, uh, who was one of the old bulls that led the Senate, one of the leaders, uh, took me under his wing and uh, taught me the budget. My reputation is knowing all that stuff about the budget was aided in no small part by knowing who to go to talk to on a given issue uh, on staff, like on the budget staff for not just the legislative budget staff, but the governor's budget staff at the time. Uh, and, and so sometimes I appear a lot smarter about it than I really was because somebody just briefed me on intricate points of whatever the issue was. It made me look <laughs> better than I really was. <laughs> I've talked to people who served in the Senate, with them, particularly Republicans, who would say to me, why are you so high on B.B.? Look at the number of bills that I sponsored. In all his years in the Senate, he hardly sponsored anything. He just didn't. He didn't have legislation. He was just there as the fixer. Y'all get out there and, and, and uh, work on what you need to work on, and I'll have it. I mean, he was the go-to guy. If you wanted something done, in the Senate, he was the guy you went to. He just likes to solve problems. He likes to he likes to run things. He likes to be the boss. He was the closer, right? He was the one who would step up and work with the governor's office, work with the House, work with whoever he needed to, uh, to make sure things got sealed up. That more epitomizes his legislative service, and in many ways his governorship, than any kind of ideology. Jay Bradford started calling me Atlanta, and somebody said, why do you call him Atlanta? I said, because everything has to go through Atlanta. <laughs> He was obviously referring to Delta Airlines because when you're on Delta, wherever you're going, you're going through Atlanta. The guy brought people together. He, he brought Democrats, Republicans. Black, white, male, female, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green. Mike Beebe really didn't look at a Republican governor. He looked at an individual that was in, elected as the governor of this state. It didn't matter. He just was one of those guys that had the ability to unite and bring people together. And you, that is a lost, lost art today. In his days in the Senate, I was amazed at his ability to assume himself the general and have smart people happily be his lieutenants or his colonels. We had a cadre of folks that were really, really close uh, of about eight or nine senators. And out of 35, if you've got a cadre of eight or nine, uh, 18 being the majority, uh, then it's much easier to be able to convince others to uh, go in, in a certain direction. Uh, you know, we didn't try to abuse it. Uh, but it was, a, it was a coalition of people. It wasn't just me, it was, it was a cadre of folks who were like-minded and, and were interested in pragmatic problem solving. Moral Harriman, who, who's perhaps equally smart, was perfectly happy to be number two. You're the general, I'm, I'm, I help, I'm aide de camp. Senator David Malone was a dean of the UA Law School at Fayetteville. He was just happy to be working under B.B.'s leadership. Cliff Hoofman, he was B.B.'s rules guy. All these people were just delighted to exercise their expertise in kind of service to his leadership. He knew how to tap into that expertise and get people on his team. Now, there were hiccups along the way. I mean, there were factions that weren't partisan factions, they were personality factions. As a senator, as a young senator, but after having been there for a few years, the Senate was under the control of Senator Nick Wilson, who wound up going to prison for abusive behavior. And there were young senators who Wilson ridiculed, as he called them, the reform-minded young golfers. That's what he called them. They were led by Beebe, who was assisted by Harriman. They rose up around 1990 and took him on. 
I remember the debate on that in, on the floor of the Senate, and it was tense. I mean, this, it was personal politics. They're, they're going against the kingpin. And I remember Bibi just wandering the floor during the debate. Not typically, he's not making speeches. He's not, he's not a front person, but he's giving signals, literal signals to people, you know, with, say something about this or, you know, he, he just had that ability to lead and that obsessive nature to control the way it was gonna turn out. That was a big accomplishment. It changed, frankly, it changed a corrupt system to a less, so not corrupt, I started to say less corrupt, not corrupt system. People had confidence in his judgment. They had confidence in his knowledge and they had confidence in his leadership skills. Once B.B. and Morrill knew that they could work together as a team, you knew that's something that was gonna be strong going forward. Uh, we could both be a little smart alecky. Uh, we both could be a little ego-driven. Uh, now again, I couldn't quite equal him in the ego part, but that's right. It really was, B.B. was the front man and Morrill was the one behind the curtain making sure everything got done. You know, personally, I think, found in each other a, a bond that maybe they didn't have as much growing up, but they found it, they found their best friend a little later on in life. Brummett wrote a column. He was talking about us in the Senate, and he said, uh, Mike Beebe is the Michael Jordan of the Senate, but Moral Harriman is the Scotty Pippen, and Scotty Pippen may be the more valuable player. Yes, back in the Chicago Bulls heyday, I, I said, BB is like Michael Jordan, and Harriman is like Scotty Pippen. And in some ways, and this is a questionable statement athletically, in some ways I said, Pippen is more valuable than Jordan, which is actually not true, but BB tells that story for one reason, he's Michael Jordan. I mean, I mean, he's Michael Jordan. He doesn't, he's not praising my metaphor. He likes to say, and as Brummett said, Pippin was actually the more valuable. He doesn't believe that either. What he loves about the story is that he's Michael Jordan. I don't think my profundity is being cited so much as BB's interest in letting people know as a state senator, I was Michael Jordan. That's why he brings it up. When the people voted for term limits, it term limited Mike in the Senate. So that was the end of his Senate career. There were people that, that wanted him to run for governor. It reached a point that at times, uh, the columnist, John Brumman and others would give him grief about it. Uh, as far as the man who's always going to run for governor. But even though that was mostly other people's aspirations and not his back at that time. Well, certainly when I decided to run for attorney general, it was precipitated uh, largely by, I had to make a decision to get in or out of politics. Because the state senate was as good as you could get and as high as you could go and still be part-time and have a real career outside of uh, politics. Uh, and so it wasn't an easy decision uh, because I'd built a law practice and uh, I'd been practicing for 30 years. Uh, and it was my firm. I was a senior partner in the firm. And then you couple that with the fact that it was gonna be a significant reduction in income. When Mike ran for attorney general, uh, I can remember the day we were at the courthouse, he was speaking uh, here in Searcy and waiting for that filing deadline period noon for an opponent. And there were a lot of people who were talking about lining up on the Republican side, and none of them filed. So he ran unopposed for attorney general. He'd never had an opponent the whole time he ran for the Senate. Now he was running for AG, and he didn't have an opponent. So I spent 24 years uh, in public office, including a statewide office, without the first election. 
in a, the first contested election. I mean, you get one vote, I guess you win uh, when you don't have an opponent. I guess everybody was afraid to, to run against Mike Beebe. I guess that's really the bottom line. Otherwise, you think about it, Republicans and Democrats, they'll get somebody, they'll pay somebody, if it's a Democrat or Republican, to get in the race just to have some opposition in it where there is a two-party system. And they couldn't even get that done against Mike Beebe. So he was one of the most powerful men in Arkansas, I think, before he knew he was one of the most powerful men in Arkansas. And so it was, you know, surprising. I mean, we had already been out campaigning, and it, you know, people had had fundraisers because you don't, you didn't know until the filing period. But he didn't have an opponent then either. He had the Bill Clinton charisma. He had the crown around him. He, uh, he was anointed almost. Uh, he was the guy. Honest, straightforward, fair, and everybody loved him. There's still a lot of retail politics in this state. Unlike Texas, where you got such huge metropolitan areas, you can't go out and see as many people. I mean, you know, you got you got Houston bigger than Arkansas. But generally speaking, Arkansas is big enough yet small enough that retail politics still matter. W what that results in in Arkansas is you better be able to communicate. You better be able to talk. You better have some degree of eloquence other than a script on a TV monitor that you can follow and cut four or five times to make a good impression. Now, we use the television, too. I mean, we, we have the ads, we have the teleprompters, we have the script, but over and above that, we also have a certain degree of, of requirement to be out in the hustings, if you will, to be out in uh, with the people making those personal appearances and communicating. So what happens? Arkansas ends up electing glib governors. If you look at Clinton, if you look at Huckabee, if you look at Bumpers, if you look at Pryor, Sid McMath, I mean, those are people uh, that had those communication skills that people in the rest of the country say, gosh, what, what are they drinking down here? Those folks are pretty good at that kind of stuff when they see them on the national stage. It's a product of the way we are and who we are and what our people expect. Uh, and I think it's partially a product of those demographics where uh, you can't just get elected only on TV ads. You've got to have something more than that. I was one of those kids that thought about today, not tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I thought about next week from time to time, but not the semester test at the end of the semester. There wasn't a magic plan laid out step by step. There wasn't a staircase uh, that led to the governor's mansion. There really wasn't. In fact, when I left the Senate, I had to make a choice. And one of the things I thought about doing was run for the United States Senate. Opted for attorney general for purely pragmatic uh, reasons at the time. I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you that at that point there was a pathway to governor. Probably B.B. thinks these things just happened for me, and he's right. I mean, that that that, that, that his opponent for the state senate uh, d uh, backed out, and that nobody ran against him, and that a certain void uh, opened in the state senate, and he ex got a leadership role, and then attorney general opened up, and then somehow, just by utter passive happenstance, he winds up governor. That's, but, and it's true that those things fell in place, but they fell in place because he tactically waited for them to fall in place. Everybody else was talking about him from the mid 80s as a governor's prospect. He got an ego gratification from that, but he didn't embrace the idea uh, completely. It wasn't like he, he was just dying to be governor. So he passed up two opportunities uh, to run against Huckabee. I think, I think he's plenty smart enough to, to see where the players are and who's on first and what's on second, and, and I don't know who's on third. And he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure he could defeat Huckabee either of those times. He watched it. He figured when the play was coming. He figured when it was his turn. Whether he's golfing, whether he's playing a parlor game, whether he's in some conversational back and forth, he's wired to win. Even though he didn't say for a long time he was going to run. I just kind of knew in his mind, you know, I'd hear little conversations on the phone, and I, I knew that 
And that was a possibility. Here, as some of you might have guessed, to announce my candidacy for the governorship of Arkansas. I was born in a tar paper shack, dirt poor, but proud. I came up the hard way. I've tried to get back. Photos, folks, and what was later reported by people that were there. It's oh, a negative ad. I do See, that's not right. Nothing like this could ever happen. I was living up to what Brummett Nimitz had about he didn't know how to handle a, a tough race. When I grow up, I want to be a politician. Tell voters what they want to hear. Say one thing to one group and something different to the other. Just like Mike Beebe. Just like Mike Beebe. There were handlers attempting to handle Mike. Yeah, it has been denounced by the There president. were people writing messages that were writing his messages. They're quoting and misquoting. And it put him in a place that he wasn't as comfortable. And so if he wasn't as comfortable, the true essence of who he was wasn't coming through as much. And DeCampo called me. And he said, let's go have a beer this afternoon, 6 o'clock at the Oyster Bar. We are sitting there having a beer, and he, we were talking about the mistakes. That, uh, that he'd witnessed from the outside. So through the course of that conversation, you know, I'm talking to him about, I know who you are and I'm not always seeing that person when I see you campaigning these days. So it came to the point where I just off the top of my head said, you need to let BB be BB. Let BB be BB. And in those simple words, what he was telling me was, my instincts were pretty good. I knew what I should do and quit being handled. Quit and let everyone else handle you to try to be so finite, walk so many tightropes, get try to, to stay out of trouble that you contort yourself like a pretzel. Let be, 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 be. And from that point on, uh, although certainly there were people that helped develop a policy issues that he deemed to be important, the messaging from there on was Mike Beebe's message. I remember watching this debate between Asa Hutchinson and, and Beebe, and Beebe talking about how he was going to reduce the grocery tax by a little and try to bring it down. And he said, politicians too much have over-promised and under-delivered, and what I'm about is under-promising and over-delivering. And I thought to myself, I've never heard boring pragmatism expressed in such a succinct, succinct and compelling way and defining way. If there was ever a Mike Beebe drinking game, that is the term that you would get the most and they would put you down the fastest on your promise and over-deliver. He started it from the beginning of the campaign in 2005 until he left office in 2014. Under-promise and over-deliver. Don't go the other way because that's what leads to cynicism. With, with all its faults, this is still the greatest form of government ever invented on this planet. So why say something when you're running that you know you can't do when you're governing? So under-promise and then over-deliver after you get there is a is a better political approach. It's also a better public policy approach. It's a better public policy because people then begin to trust you more. They begin to believe in you more. They don't think you're the stereotypical, oh, he's a lying politician that'll promise you whatever he needs to promise you to get your vote. The people that elected you, that obviously they like you, they wouldn't have elected you. I mean, once in a while you can disappoint them and then go explain to them why you disappointed them and try to convert them to understand the logic of what you knew was right, and that's why you did it, even at the expense of some unpopular response from, uh, from your voters. That's the thing I think that separates just a politician from uh, what we used to call a statesman. I know the best thing about him is he tells it like it is, and the worst thing about him is he tells it like it is. <laughs> and telling the truth, I remember Early on, one event, speaking to teachers, they wanted a raise. It, it just wasn't feasible at that time. But they respected the fact that he was honest with them, and he, he told them they couldn't have a raise. And he did it in a way that they respected it. They didn't like it, but they respected it. 
I think everybody who runs for office that does that ends up getting rewarded for it. Sure, sometimes you say stuff that people do not want to hear. <laughs> they do not want to hear that you can't do this for them or do that for them or promise them all this stuff. They don't want to hear it. But in the long run, the majority of them will respect you for telling them what you believe to be the truth. And I believe in the long run, the majority of them will reward you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the governor and first lady of the state of Arkansas, Mike and Ginger BB. We always get who we need when we need them. And what we needed in 2007 was Mike BB, and that's who we got. We had a brunch at Trapman Hall for all the, to thank all the workers and the staff volunteers and all those folks. And I, I had bought a, we had bought a condo in Midtown, Little Rock, when I was attorney general, so I wouldn't have to go back and forth every night to come home to Cersei. She was at the condo packing stuff up. So I got a phone call from a friend who was there with her, said, you better get over here. Uh, she's crying, she's upset. Uh, and so I left the Trapnel Hall uh, brunch, luncheon, whatever it was, and went to the condo and tried to figure out what was wrong, what was going, what, what was their deal. And uh, it was obvious that the enormity of what was about to happen, as the politician's wife, who now is gonna be in all the spotlight, uh, had hit her. And I said, well, why now? You've known this was coming. And she looked at me and she said, I didn't think you'd win. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing like your wife bringing you back to, to reality. <laughs> you know, I don't recall as we sit here going in with an ax to grind or a preconceived notion of uh, what I wanted to change the world about. But I was always interested in education. And I was always particularly interested in higher education. I always felt it was higher education that was a major component of why I got there. Uh, it was higher education that gave me the tools to be what I was and to have the life I had. And so that was a particular area of interest for me that has prevailed to this very day, never waned. We are one people. We are Arkansas. I want to be first. We've achieved it in a lot of categories. With your help, we'll get it done. Thank you for being here. He fought uh, for education in our school system, but he always says, and it, I mean, it's true, economic development and education go hand in hand. He really had an unprecedented tenure as an economic development governor, bringing tremendous jobs to the state, growing the state, growing our per capita income, and also increasing the numbers of students that graduated. We buried education to jobs and economic development. The rest of the folks can talk about it. We do it. You can't get good jobs. You can't have economic development without a qualified workforce but it doesn't do you any good to educate folks and have a qualified workforce if you don't have jobs for them. All you're doing is being a farm club and sending all your young people that you've educated to New York or LA or Minneapolis to get a good job. So they go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin. There's not a priority one and priority two. They're one and one A. So all these other issues, social justice, criminal justice, healthcare, poverty, all those things are major problems that you have to confront. But if you get those first two things right, of education and economic development, then it makes all of those other things easier to solve with that educated and employed electorate. All right, that's me, obviously as governor at some uh, elementary school talking to kids and um, got a sock or something on my hand acting like it's a Muppet or a puppet or a whatever. And obviously it's working because these kids are laughing. My someone who knew that humor and laughter were an important part of keeping your wits about you in the job that he had. 
He has a knowledge of pop culture that seems to come to a screeching halt about 1990. So what that meant for those of us who spent a lot of time on the road with him and traveling around the state, you got exposed to a lot of that music that he was into, you know, during his formative professional years. A lot of Elvis, a lot of Elvis. He sang Elvis songs all the time and we learned to enjoy it. Generally had to, on the executive detail who were in charge of making sure he, he got everywhere, that part of their training was just driving a car around with Elvis blaring and someone next to them singing very loudly. He's crazy on cue. Hey! We had a great collection of gray hairs and youthful exuberance. We, we had that good mix of experience, savvy, uh, and, and young, idealistic, energetic, uh, talented uh, people. He didn't strive to make us be like him. He took who we were and what we are and allowed us to use our strengths and talents to be part of an incredible team. And, and I had the best chief of staff any governor's ever had. I already told you, I mean, I had a brother as my chief of staff. I mean, we all used to compare it to John Robert Kennedy in terms of how close we were. I know he and I would both credit that staff with a huge part of the success. But again, uh, that staff would credit him. And, and they were loyal to him, and it was something that came natural. The point of all that is, you do it with other people. And, and you, you, you share or give away the credit, it all come back to me. My staff does good, it reflects good on me. My staff does bad, it reflects bad on me. But it's ultimately my responsibility. And, and what ends up happening is when you give all the credit away to the people that work for you, or the people that you're leading, you become a more effective leader, they'll follow you even more. They'll, they'll, they'll work that much harder for you. Mike Beebe didn't do this by himself. Nobody does it alone. We are in this together. We are doing this together. We are building our state together. We're creating an opportunity for our children and our grandchildren together. Each of you has a role. And so Reagan was right. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> you can get a lot done if you don't care who gets the credit. I'm moderate to liberal on most social things, but I'm real conservative about money. And I suppose it's my upbringing. His essence, what he was about, was drawing a good state budget eight times, basically. He had an amazing grasp of the Arkansas budgetary process and both how it was funded and how money was used. I always erred on the side of being conservative in budgeting, and I think it stood us in good stead through that uh, recession. You have to remember the greatest recession that had hit this country since the Great Depression uh, occurred basically starting the second year of his tenure as governor. The state was fortunate to have him during that time. This is a map of the United States. It was an insert in uh, June 28th, or June 24th, uh, Time Magazine article. And it projects the darker the color, if you can see that, the worse off you are. The worst projection being the bottom with a 56.6% budget shortfall this year compared to last year. And the lighter the color, the better you are. Only four states are not projected for any percentage of budget shortfall. North Dakota, Montana, Alaska, and your Arkansas. continue to do it. I hope you'll vote for me come November. Thank you very much. In 2010, a, there was a red tide that overtook the state, except for, in regard to Mike Beebe, who as a Democrat seeking a second term won all 75 counties. How did he do that? You know, he always told people the truth. He didn't attempt to say something in public and then go do something different in private. And if they knew you and they trusted you, they would vote for you. 
And that was his philosophy. And he thought that in 2010, that would work for him and that would help him even carry counties that he didn't carry in 2006. And he was right. He carried all of them. The Arkansas voters are independent enough to distinguish between let's just vote this ticket or this tide. Uh, they, they'll distinguish that and vote for the person over that if they know that person well enough to make that distinction. Fortunately for me, I, the voters knew me or felt like they knew me well enough that they could withstand whatever that trend was. A man doesn't carry all 75 counties in the state of Arkansas as a Democrat when every other office is going to a Republican candidate and do that in an overwhelming fashion, that he hasn't gained the confidence of the voters and of the public. That's pretty inspirational, I doubt. I know you'll never see that happen again. Together, together, let's put our head on the pillow when all this is done and say, we left it better than we found it. That's our charge, that's our responsibility. God bless you and God bless the state of Arkansas. B.B. has become governor in a Democratic state that has suddenly become a Republican state, and he's dealing with a Republican majority on this defining issue to whether to expand Medicaid under Obamacare. A time when the Medicaid expansion was extremely unpopular. Uh, we were the only southern state to implement it. You know, why? In my opinion, Mike Beebe. And he put some of his people together with some legislators and said, come up with something. He brought in and sought the help of leading Republican legislators. He sought their advice on it. He allowed them to be part of crafting a solution. And again, I'm back to my point, he was always inclusive. Arkansas's constitution required a three-quarter majority in each house for that private option to appropriate money. And how do you get 75% of the vote with a Republican legislature? Work it out. Uh, it, it mattered not to him whether it was it was done in a traditional government way or not. It, what mattered to him is we can get it done. He didn't think of the private option. So as again, he was always the first to hand out, you know, those credits where where he felt they were due, and he was the first to acknowledge, you know, there were people besides him who could make things happen. When I was a boy, it was noble for a mother to want her son to be president of the United States, or mayor, or governor, or senator. It was noble for a family to aspire for their daughter or their son to hold some elected political position. And something happened between my boyhood and now that changed all that and politics became a dirty word, and politicians became a dirty profession. I don't know what all the reasons were or if there was one reason, but for whatever reason, we've got this cynicism now about government with all its faults, with every politician who ever broke your heart, lied to you, stole your money. It's still the greatest form of self-government ever invented on this planet, the greatest democracy in the history of mankind. And the only way we lose that is if we take for granted our institutions, and if we throw them away, and if we forget to get involved, and if we get so cynical we don't go vote, or we don't care who wins, or we just treat everybody with a broad same brush, the only folks that can hurt us are ourselves. And that only happens when we forget 200 years plus of history of an experiment in self-government that hadn't been matched on the planet. When you think all the people who died or sacrificed to maintain that, first to get it, and then to maintain it. And we got an obligation not to be so damn cynical. I would hope that I leave our Kansans in a place where they felt more confident about themselves, where they felt more competent about themselves. What I hope I've done more than anything else is instill a little bit of swagger, almost, but not quite like a Texas swagger. I don't want to be arrogant about it. You've got the most 
successful state government career of our generation. BB, from a young man, from a state senator, and then attorney general, and then a governor, in the time that he did it, there's nothing else like it that, that shows that kind of long-term command of the process. I want you all to know, I love you. He didn't have the log cabin story. He was the log He was cabin able story. to rise from the tar paper shack to the heights that, to which he rose. What a young boy from Amigan could become in the great state of Arkansas. Probably has the best reputation as a governor ever in the state of Arkansas. We're, we're as good as anybody else, and we can do what anybody else can do. If our people feel that. 19 years of age, 20 years of age, want to be governor of the state of Arkansas. Where'd that come from? He was the right man at the right time. That's a legacy. That's what you want to instill. You ever heard anybody going out as popular as Mike Beebe went out? He'll always be a voice. That's what a leader's supposed to do. Help his people feel like there's nothing they can't accomplish. Mike and I sometimes talk about what would our mothers think if they could see where we ended up? You know, just what would they think? Um, they'd be proud. This is Governor Mike BB. Oh, yeah, I, I make everybody mad. Uh, uh, yeah, Arkansas best list. Uh, best gravy, uh, Red Apple Inn. Close second, Main Street Cafe in Searcy, Arkansas. They cook the heck out of the roof before they pour the milk in it, and therefore it's tan instead of pure white, and therefore it's got flavor, and it's like Grandma used to make. I mean, it's real gravy. It's You can look at gravy and tell if it's any good or not just by the color of it. Uh, if it's too white, it's pretty bland and not very good. Uh, George's Cheeseburger in Fort Smith, knockout. Dixie Pig uh, uh, in Blyville, French fries to die for. Uh, I mean, uh, Craig's Barbecue, Sims Barbecue. Uh, my favorite plate lunch? Sandy's in Little Rock. If you've never gone to Sandy's, you have missed the plate lunch. And I like BJ's and I like Homer's, but Sandy's has just got something. It's uh, only open at noon, It's uh, and it's hard to find. It's on 15th Street. What a great plate lunch. <laughs> My favorite football team's the Red Wolves. The best football team's probably the Razorbacks. Uh, you're talking about in Arkansas. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they've had a century worth of uh, time to be able to get to where they are, and great program. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.